Welcome to the Learner Center Collaborative Podcast. I am your host, Katie Martin, and today I get to chat with Dr. Lillian Nanez from Ector County. And I know that you are going to love this episode. Dr. Nanez is the Associate Superintendent of Ector County ISD in Odessa, Texas. As an experienced leader, she brings a wealth of knowledge, experience, and joy wherever she goes. Welcome, Lilia. Hi there, Katie. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm so excited. So as we get into the conversation today, um, I'm really excited for a lot of people just to learn about you and the work. Uh, but first, let's start with who you are and some of the experiences that have shaped you throughout your journey. Sure. So, um, so uh, this is my 30th year in education. Uh, interestingly enough, I stepped away from public education for nine years. Um, I worked with a publishing company for nine years as a content specialist, and then later as an account executive, which gave me a lot of perspective on how culture, climate has an impact on just the perception of uh, a school district or a school the moment you walk into the building. And so I learned a lot from that experience, but my heart just tugged me back into public education. And so the reason I'm an educator really to begin with is because of equity. So I'm gonna date myself. And um, so I grew up in a small town in West Texas, Alpine, Texas. And when I started my uh, first grade, um, the Mexican school had closed just a few years before I showed up. And as a young first grader, second grader, all the way through fifth grade, I, I felt something wasn't right. And at the time, um, Mexicans or Hispanics, we were the minority in Alpine. Um, and it just felt like, teachers didn't want me there. It wasn't that they were mean or they intentionally wanted to leave me out. They just didn't know what to do with dark skinned, curly headed Mexican kids. <laughs> and so I was invisible. I didn't know at the time the why uh, or what was going on, but it, I truly was an invisible child for all those years. And it wasn't until I got to junior high, sixth grade, where a band director noticed that I had talent. And when he told me that I had talent, then my world went from black and white to high definition color, v vivid, you know, it was so vibrant, uh, my life, because Mr. Jimmy Rhodes and Bill Shipp, those two band directors, saw me for the first time. And it really was all of that that brought me to public education because we have to see kids every single day. Every single student needs to feel like they are seen, like they are heard, like they matter. And so that's why. I've invested so much energy, time um, to educating kids. And it's because I want all children to feel like they belong. It, it doesn't feel good to be left out. No, I, I've heard you share this story, you know, before, and we've talked about it. And just, it strikes me when you talk about even watching your face, when you talk about being invisible, that pain of a first grader still is there to be invisible and to not be seen and not feel like you belong. Uh, and to think that we have young people who are still in our systems today who are invisible and don't feel like they belong. And the power- well, it, It's heartbreaking because we know that we have that today. And right. it may not be a race issue or things like that, but when you look at data, like our panorama data, where students um, you know, document and share how much they feel connected to their schools, the good news is that kids really feel connected mm -hmm. at the elementary levels, but it just plummets at the secondary level. And so, you know, so I, I'm spending a lot of time and effort this year 
connecting with our secondary teachers and our secondary um, campus leaders because I want to help them. I want to enable them to be able to connect with kids um, and to make sure that our kids feel connected and feel seen and feel heard. And they all want to do that. Every single one of our employees want to do that for children. Yeah, I, I, and I see that across the nation too. Educators don't get into this work to ignore kids or to not make them feel seen. But sometimes the structures and the, the busyness of the, of the day and what we think we have to do prevents us from that first and foundational goal of recognizing and seeing kids. And you're right, the data show that as kids go through school, they feel less like they belong and less like they enjoy school. And it, it just takes that welcoming kids at the door, saying hi. You know, getting to know them, it makes such a big difference, like your band teacher. And you said that was in middle school, right? That right. it's possible. Um, and what a difference you can make as an educator when you see when you see young people and recognize them for their many, many talents. Mm -hmm. So I I love that that is giving you inspiration to to do that 30 years later, seeing the power and helping helping educators. Um, really get back to that priority. It's really powerful to hear you get excited about that work. And well, we certainly do it together and teachers also need to feel like they are seen yeah. and heard. And, um, you know, yesterday, I've got to share this with you. Right. Yesterday, I was invited to one of our elementary um, luncheons um, one of our largest elementary schools that is on the farthest side of West Odessa, it literally feels like you're driving, you know, to, to Monaghan's, you know, a different uh, county in a different community. Um, but they invited me to lunch and we talked about being champions. They are the, the kids champions. And so one of the teachers came up to me and I hadn't seen her, you know, in several months because we had summer break, but when I went to her classroom last year, I noticed that there was a little girl in her classroom who was having some emo um, an emotional morning. And so the teacher was kind enough to save her that, that little girl's breakfast. And as the teacher was teaching and doing her 10 minute whole group connector, the little girl needed to hug her leg. And she just let the little girl hug her leg and she was you know, patting her on the back while the teacher took care of the class. And that really touched me. And so I left a note for the teacher telling her how much I admired the attention that, that she gave that little girl. And it didn't affect her classroom instruction. Mm -hmm. She went on, but that little girl felt like she belonged. And so I left her that note and she brought up her phone with the picture of the note and showed it to me yesterday. And she said, I shared this with all my table mates here at lunch because this note spoke to me and it made me feel like you saw how much I care about kids. And it just touched me, you know, they all need to do that, you know? And so I was so proud that just a little note that took about two minutes to write had an impact on that teacher. I think that that is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that story because it you were first you were there and you were showing up and you noticed something, but going that extra putting the extra effort into writing a note, like you said, it took two minutes, but how powerful for that teacher to be able to have that connection with you and feel validated mm -hmm. for her work. It makes me think so often you know people say my teachers don't care about me or my administrators don't care about me and we know how much educators care but we don't often show it sometimes in ways that people feel it so making sure to take that to make the effort to write the note to say thank you to tell somebody um what you saw how much of a difference that can make she was a, a true example of being student-centered and learner-centered. She, she was the exemplar of that, that morning. Well, she has an administrator who can model that and who can um, also, 
also see the, the great things in people, which is a really powerful thing. So this is something that I, I recognize about you and I see it. You bring joy wherever you go as you engage with your team, whether you're on stage or in these small conversations or just leaving notes. Um, you know, you make you make things fun and joyful, um, but you're also really focused on the, the turnaround, you know, you call yourself a turnaround administrator. So how do you see, how do you make time for joy when the work is challenging and you have so much on your plate? Why is it so important to, to make sure that there's joy in those connections for you? Well, hard work can be fun when you know what the journey must be. And so when we know what the end is and what our end goal is, we start uh, at the beginning by, um, you know, establishing the steps that we must take, but including joy in there, you know, uh, just um, acknowledging people, smiling at people, um, but throwing out a joke um, every now and then. But I think what makes our work joyful is that we get to know one another and that we share personal experiences with one another. Because if you can't laugh at yourself, then, you know, what's the point? Um, and so making sure that everyone feels safe whenever we're in a meeting, um, and our meetings are very serious. Our meetings are very task um, oriented and goal driven, but we always enjoy each other's company. And so we always um, share personal stories, whether it's in the classroom um, or, you know, the time that we went out um, doing a home visit and, I, you know, uh, we had to use um, the cane of an elderly lady that was with us to you know, knock dogs away from us. Um, you know, it's those kinds of stories that just little antidotes that we share with one another. So they'll know, gosh, you know, you've been in our shoes and you know how it feels to be where we were or where we are. Um, it's always very helpful. Um, and that, that kind of stuff brings joy to any environment. And, and that's how we spread the joy and enjoy the work. When we, when we are elbows deep in it. Yeah. And I love how you shared that. It's the work is hard. The work is tough. You're not, you're not detracting from the goal. You're not taking away from what you're trying to do, but building relationships, uh, finding opportunities to have fun and connect through the work. Um, and I think that's so important. Sometimes people get, feel like the work's hard. So we have to take a break and we have to go do something else, which breaks are good, but but the, the power is really in finding people that you are excited to work together with and you can be connected with um, and learn through the journey. So you mentioned Ector County, which, and you mentioned Odessa, Texas. So for those people who are listening who might not know where in the world Odessa, Texas is, will you share a little bit more about your community before we talk about the work that you're doing there? Absolutely. So we are in Odessa, Texas. We are in the Permian Basin. Um, we are known for uh, producing oil, oil and gas. So we're, we are the largest producer of oil and gas in the Americas. And right now uh, we produce more oil and gas than any other place in the world. So we are a very industrial community. Um, and so the, the blue collar workers live in Odessa the white collar workers or all the office um, and the, the tall buildings with the oil companies, mm -hmm. uh, executives is just 20 miles down the street in Midland. And so those of you that are fans of football, um, you might remember a movie or a series on TV called Friday Night Lights that was based on Permian High School, and that is one of our comprehensive high schools in Odessa, Texas. So we're known for Friday Night Lights, um, but we do have five high schools in Odessa. Thank you for sharing that. And I've seen pictures The Friday Night Lights are no joke. People come out to watch the football games still today. 
They do. When we have our crosstown rivalry uh, between our two uh, large comprehensive high schools, we'll get 20,000 people um, in the stadium at Ratliff Stadium. And um, I'll tell you what, people across the country love to play non-district games in Ratliff. So sometimes we'll have um, schools from other states that want to travel to Odessa to be able to play at Permian, I'm sorry, play against Permian um, at Ratliff Stadium because of Friday Night Lights. So cool. Well, if you haven't seen the show, would recommend it so you get a little bit of a sense of uh, what what Ector County um, is like and, and the community. And having had the opportunity to visit and be there, some of the most amazing humans, really great people, again, just really care about the work, care about the kids, um, and it's a great place to be. Thank you. So, one of the many things that I admire about the Ector County team um, is the way that curriculum instruction and technology work so seamlessly together. And you don't see this all the time because it's like, well, this is the tech team, we have to do this, and then we have our curriculum and instruction, and teachers are getting mixed messages, their silos, and you all have really put a lot of effort into collaborating. So can you share a little bit more, like how did you make this work? How is it possible? And what's been the impact on uh, the classroom and the educators? Um, so really when, when I started, this is my seventh year here at Ector County. And um, when the pandemic hit, um, we used some ESSER funds uh, to, to provide devices for, every, for all 33,000 students that we serve. And so when the pandemic hit, um, we were already moving toward having a learning management system. And so at that point, the CNI team and the technology team were already collaborating to, to um, select the best learning management system where technology had uh, the, the, the program that met their requirements, and that CNI had the management system where we could house all of our resources and documents where teachers would have easy access. Well, all of that really was accelerated with the pandemic. And so when we shut school down in 2020, our CNI team had to put up uh, the online learning within three days. And we couldn't have done it without the help of, of the technology. It was, they were called instructional technology at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't have done it without teaming up with the instructional technology team. The following year, they changed their name to digital learning. And that's when the brotherhood and sisterhood just happened. Um, uh, we really worked hard to get, you know, to, to come together to use common language, common vocabulary, and share the message. Everything that digital learning was sharing with requirements and usage and devices and Promethean boards and our learning, learning management system, our CNI team learned. And so the journey, um, just we came together. And so when we started um, putting uh, things into the learning management system, we did it side by side with the digital learning team. So anytime a digital specialist would go to a classroom, they knew exactly where the content was. Anytime our CNI instructional specialist went to a classroom and a teacher needed help with connecting a device or something like that, they knew how to do it. And so, for, for four years now, we've been talking the same language. Now we have paired up specialists from the digital learning team with specialists from the curriculum and instruction team. We have partners, they have common schools. And so we have really centered, you know, come together in a synergy kind of environment to um, where we know each other's work. And so that's how we support each other. Um, and it has been a wonderful journey. I love that. And the foundation of being in the work together, getting to know each other, having those shared experiences um, really allows them to work together really powerfully. Right. I, I love that. Well, 
building on that foundation of the connection of the team, really creating that sense of joy. Um, you know, my, I have a deep love for new teacher development, especially and, and induction and coaching. And that's initially how I got connected with you all in Ector is, is through the, the coaching work. Um, so as many places right now are facing teacher shortages and you know, they're looking to hire new teachers and having all these vacancies. You all in Ector are thinking differently about teacher development, induction, and the way that you organize teachers. So I wanna kind of highlight some of the, the programs and see if you can share a little bit more context. So the first is you have this new teacher university um, and launch program that you were telling me about. Can you share a little bit about what a, what a new teacher experiences as they come into the district? Yes, so the launch is something that the Talent Development, Digital Learning and CNI uh, started implementing this spring and summer. Um, you know, in years past, it was always a struggle to get the new teachers their emails so they could have their credentials to log in. Um, they wouldn't get a device until new teacher in-service began. And so we were, they were always feeling behind the, the, you know, behind because they didn't have access to their device. They didn't have access to any of the resources. And so I, I think the first launch session happened while school was still in session in the spring. So human resources hires, you know, campuses select their team, human resources will hire and process new hires. And when we get like 50 of them, then the launch session happens three hours where in, instructional technology comes and assigns and gives a device to all new teachers. Uh, digital learning comes in and gives them their credentials, shows them how to log into the learning management system. And then CNI steps in and just gives them learning management 101, just to teach the teachers how to navigate through Schoology and through Seesaw, which is the learning management system that we use for pre-K, K, uh, first graders. And so um, the teachers, so even if you're an experienced teacher, but you're new to Ector County, they are so appreciative because never have they had access to a device or their resources until they show up for new teacher in service. And so this has really been a huge success. Um, the talent development, uh, instructional technology, digital learning, and CNI have done four sessions throughout the summer. And we even, they even customized a launch session for about 60 international teachers just last week. Um, so we have international teachers that come to Ector County ISD, and so much of this is new for them. Mm -hmm. And so digital learning and CNI had a, a, a launch session that was just customized for our international teachers. And so of all the things that we've done as new teachers have come to the district, this has been the most effective. And so four sessions, one starting before school was out, several during the summer, and then a customized one for our international teachers last week. Amazing feedback. I love that. And, you know, again, it goes back to this whole theme of we want to make sure people feel seen, that they belong, they have it, they need just those, um, that attention, it matters because when you start, so many teachers start and feel like they're just thrown into a classroom, they don't have the resources, and that's not necessarily starting off on your best foot. Um, or providing the best um, the best supported educator for students. That's so right, Katie. I'm sorry. It it really is a more personalized opportunity mm -hmm. for new teachers because we'll hire an average of 300 teachers. And wow. so if we're handing out devices on the first day of new teacher uh, training, it, it's not very personalized. Right. But when you have a small group of 50, our teams can sit around and give personalized attention 
to these smaller groups of teachers. And so then they they get to play, they get to go into the, the resources and start exploring even before they show up for any training session. And so it's that more personal attention where we see them, we hear them, we're able to answer their individual questions. It's It's been amazing. I love that. So once they get in, they they know that they belong in Ector County, then you have created new teacher university. So what do I experience as a new teacher um, in this new teacher university? So uh, human resources plays a big role in new teacher um, uh, university. Uh, they'll talk logistics, uh, benefits. Teachers are able to sign up for their benefits, make selections. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, so many different things that when uh, teachers are brought on board that we have to do training for them, they get Title IX training, which is required. And so, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into new teacher that doesn't even have anything to do with instruction. Mm -hmm. It's how our systems work in Ector County ISD. Everything from operations, how do you put in a work order? How do you do um, a, a ask or, or submit a help ticket if you need something done in your classroom, a work order? So it's those processes that they get um, uh, some support on. But in addition to that, we give them the nuts and bolts of what is expected from the CNI side. Mm -hmm. So uh, teachers are put into the content that they are uh, going to teach. And at new teacher, CNI provides the nuts and bolts of what they're what uh, we expect them to do during uh, class, during school year. Awesome. So you're giving them just the foundational pieces. And then you've also restructured the positions and in some places re, um, redesigned how teams collaborate. So you've really invested in teacher leadership. Can you share a little bit more about your opportunity culture and what it means for a teacher to be a leader and still be in the classroom in some instances? Yes, yeah, so this is one of the best initiatives that Ector County ISD has engaged in. Um, because we had such a teacher shortage, um, we really invested in a lot of human capital work in Ector County ISD. One of those is uh, opportunity culture. And so back in 2020, 2021, we partnered with Public Impact and they really helped us set up our opportunity culture work. So currently, we are now starting year four of implementation of opportunity culture. And what that is, is that very effective teachers that have a track record of growing kids academically can apply to be a multi-classroom leader. And what that means is that that multi-classroom leader, this very effective teacher will work with students and then coach and mentor teachers either at their grade level or within their content. And so we can have um, an MCL level one. So like if I'm a fourth grade teacher, a multi-classroom leader, I may have three to four teachers on my grade level that I will coach and mentor. And my objective is not only to improve the data and student outcomes from my classroom, but to help the, uh, improve the student outcomes from the entire grade level. And so those very effective multi-classroom leaders or MCLs get a $15,000 or a $17,000 stipend, depending on how many teachers that they have on their docket. I... This is such a fascinating way to approach teacher leadership, um, and it makes a lot of sense. When I've talked to some of your MCLs, I've heard just they feel so empowered. They get to stay in the classroom with kids, which is where they want to be as teacher leaders. They have opportunities to grow beyond you know one single classroom and influence a group of teachers but also still continue to work with students 
And sometimes we, we distinguish teachers from administrators and you either have to leave the classroom or, you know, to, to be an administrator um, or to be a leader. And I think this is such a cool space that really can reimagine the role of the teacher. And, you know, we were just talking about new teachers. So my understanding is that these, these new teachers also get to work with an MCL. So they get to work with a really high quality teacher and mentor who's still in the classroom who can help coach them up and support them as they're, as they're learning their new role. Yeah, so the idea of coaching is really has expanded over this over several years at Ector County ISD. Um, so not all our campuses are opportunity culture campuses. It is an initiative where we work on it being budget neutral. So for example, if you have five teachers in, in a grade level and you're struggling to fill that fifth position, one of those teachers can apply to be an MCL. We absorb the classrooms from that fifth classroom into the other four. So class sizes go up, but every person has the ability to serve the kids in a, in a, in a quality way, because first the MCL has a reach associate um, that will cover her class while she is in the other classrooms coaching and mentoring other teachers. And we have data, very strong data that shows the effectiveness of a quality MCL. Oh my goodness, our map data shows that where there is a teacher, a, a, a highly effective MCL, mm -hmm. the data for that entire grade level or content, you can see it just by looking, very oh. clear data. And so it, it's amazing. And the beautiful thing about that, Katie, is that the high quality teachers want to stay in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so we are very proud of the fact that Ector County ISD is a, the home of the $100,000 teacher. Because if you are an MCL and you get that stipend, we also implement the teacher incentive allotment and all teachers can qualify for the teacher incentive allotment. But we have MCLs that are at our most at-risk campuses that get their $17,000 stipend and can get up to $22,000 in teacher incentive allotment by growing their kids academically. So the first year that we implemented the teacher incentive allotment, we handed out $889,000. Year two, our teachers got better there were $2.2 million that we gave out. This past academic year, it was $3.2 million that teachers, that number of teachers, there are over 300 teachers qualified for teacher incentive allotment and they get extra money. The more at risk your school is, the higher your check is. And so, so we are $100,000 teacher. <laughs> and you're, well, you're, so they're getting paid, they're getting recognized, they're being able to grow in their own profession and make that impact. Um, and, and like I said, I just talking to teachers, they feel so empowered. They feel like they're continuing to develop their skills, not only as a great educator of young people, but also growing young professionals um, to be great teachers as well. And I love that you said one great MCL lifts all the whole grade level, um, you know, creating that culture and helping them all know, develop the skills to be exceptional educators. That's right. Really, really great. Um, so beyond MCLs, you have additional coaches in Ector County uh, and, and just a really strong culture of coaching, which, which I think is a really powerful thing. Across the country right now, we have people cutting coaches, cutting teachers on special assignment because, because of budget and staffing. Um, and a lot of people are saying, we're putting teachers back into the classroom because we don't have staffing or, or resources. Why do you keep investing in, co in coaches? And, and how can you kind of influence maybe other administrators who are thinking of cutting them? Why has it been such a powerful force in Ector County? Well, because we are investing in our people. 
um, that it has been part of our strategic plan for the past five years, and it is paying off. Our retention, our teacher retention is getting better. Um, we want teachers to be happy working in Ector County ISD. Happy teachers equal to uh, better student outcomes. Uh, supported teachers result in higher student outcomes. And so that is our goal to invest in our teachers because, um, because our kids are worth it. Mm -hmm. And so we're not gonna jeopardize um, cutting what we know has worked. Um, we have to make cuts in other places, but we're not gonna cut where we are investing uh, in our teachers because they're the, one, they're the one thing that matters the most in the classroom. Resources are great, you know, yes, we understand, but what makes a resource work is that teacher oh and the God. quality of instruction and how they engage kids is what matters. Yes, I cannot say that, you know, enough that being able to invest in teachers, I appreciate that you said that you've seen that it works. We know that teachers who get high quality professional development opportunities, who are, you know, poured into as educators, uh, they have the capacity to do that for their students. And that's the most important. So one more question for you before we go to rapid fire. You've talked a lot about pouring into your teachers, creating a culture for your own uh, team. Where do you go to learn and be inspired? Um, well, there are several places that I, I really um, focus in on. One is you guys. Learner-centered collaborative have really, you, you all enable leaders to pause, take a deep breath, and reflect. And I think everyone, everyone in public education need to do that. Because we can't continue to go and go and go and go and go without pausing, mm -hmm. pausing to reflect, pausing to rest, and then pausing to network with others. Yeah. The networking is so important, whether it is networking about work or just networking about parenthood. <laughs> um, it is critical uh, because we have to take care of self. If we don't take care of self, we are not able to take care of others. Yeah. And so you all have been a blessing to me as a leader, both professionally and personally. Um, I also in, engage in um, uh, working with uh, colleagues from across the state of Texas that deal with, um, you know, my passion is reading language arts. And so I am part of a team. Um, uh, I've been an Abydos writing trainer since 1994. Um, that's a writing project here in Texas that really focuses on um, uh, reading language arts. And um, the thing, the powerful thing about that group is that you are evaluated by your peers. And so in order to continue to the next level of being a, a trainer, you are evaluated once every three years by your peers and they determine whether or not you continue, you can continue to be a writing trainer. And so I started that journey back in 1993 and four. And so years ago, you start out as a trainer, then you become a pewter, then a bronze, then a silver, then a gold, and ultimately a diamond. And that's a 16 year journey. Wow. Um, and once you get to the diamond level, you don't have to recertify again. Um, but that group of individuals really, um, we speak the same language. We all have that passion about reading language arts because if a child can't read or write, they can't do math, they can't do science, they can't do social studies. And so um, I, I find solitude with that group annually. And I've been going to that conference every year since 1993. A lot of your listeners might not have even been born at that time, but it is a powerful group of passionate educators that know the importance of literacy um, in all areas of public education. 
So I love and, and for all of us, and so just finding finding your people, right? Making sure that you have people who push you. You were talking about pewter, silver, bronze. You know, the Olympics are happening right now, <laughs> and you know, I was inspired by the women's um, gymnastics team, and they're talking about you know, iron sh sharpens iron, and they're getting better because of each other. So just making that connection that you've got to find your people who mm -hmm. can really make you make you better to support you and see you but also challenge you to keep growing which is why i love that you're evaluated by your peers so you have that um, mutual respect um, and expectation to keep growing right so right. powerful all right we're going to do rapid fire um, in our last couple minutes so i have a few questions just quick whatever comes to mind um, so the first question is one, so what is one thing we should stop doing in education? The same old thing, because we've always done it that way. Love it. What's one thing we should start doing? Reflecting. Yes. What should we keep doing? Listening to kids. Yes. What are you focusing on learning right now as an individual? How I can help the social studies teachers in eighth grade. Awesome. Uh, what is one thing that many people might not know about you? That I sang Tejano music as a substitute for my husband's band years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, what is a favorite quote or saying that, that guides you? When they go low, we go high. Yes. What's something that you're grateful for right now? My husband. Lucky you. And finally, what is your hope for the future of education? That um, politics get out of the way of what we need to do for kids. This is our, our nation, our nation's youth that we're dealing here. And they're not pawns. One day, these young children are going to take care of all those politicians. And we just hope, they should hope, that every single child, whether they're poor or purple or green or yellow or rich, can read a doctor's order while they're in a nursing home. Love it. We got to focus on the kids. Focus on focus what matters. On them. Focus on them, right? And yeah. And as we started making sure they're seeing that they feel like they belong and that they can read. That's right. Lilia, thank you so much. I know you have so much happening right now as the year kicks off. I am so grateful for the time to connect and for you to share so many great things happening in Ector County right now. Thank you, Katie. It is always a pleasure to, to spend time with you.